That's the type. And Moses told them that they couldn't pick any lamb. The lamb specifically had to be without blemish. It had to be like a perfect lamb. Here's what he said. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year has to be a one-year-old. And you should take it out from the sheep or from the goats. That's the type. That's the shadow. What's it pointing towards? Jesus died on Passover. Did you know that? He died on Passover? When he came on the public scene, when he first started his ministry, John the Baptist saw him at a distance. He was baptizing everybody. He stopped what he was doing. He looked at Jesus and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Ah, he was talking to Jews. They got it. Passover lamb, Jesus is the lamb. The lamb saved me, he saves me. I get it. Now I told you the blood on the doorposts, it had to be in a certain way. It was on, on the top and on the two sides, kind of like this. Isn't that interesting? Nice little symbol, a nice little sign. And even down to the very detail, a lamb without blemish. Listen to what the Bible says. He too was without blemish, and he redeemed us, quote, with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1.19. Passover was a holiday that God gave to the Jewish people, not so that they could keep it alone, but so that it could give them a picture of a bigger Passover lamb that was going to come and save the entire world. That's what I mean by a type. That's Passover. That's the first holiday. Remember, the law is only a shadow. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Holiday number two, the festival of unleavened bread. Now, prior to, to Passover, they were told to go through their house and take out all the leaven. And we've done this on several years. We don't do it every year, but it's kind of fun. We'll go through the house, we'll get all the bread, we'll either eat it or throw it in the freezer or give it away. We'll look at our cereal boxes, see which ones have yeast in them and which don't. We'll get the tortillas that don't have yeast in them. They're my favorite anyway, because then we'll eat tortillas that week instead of puffy bread to kind of keep in line with the tradition that they did. We thought it was kind of fun. Gets old after a while, though. How many of you have ever had a peanut butter and jelly burrito? See your hands. All right. <laughs> so they take all the yeast out of their house, and they'd have to go yeastless for a week. That was the ancient Passover requirement. They had to do this. They'd be excommunicated if they didn't. It was a big law. But why? What's the purpose? It was never said. It's got to be pointing to something bigger. It's got to be pointing to something better. Then you get to the New Testament, and listen to what it says. Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And if you look at that chapter, it's talking about sin. And it says, get rid of it. We're all new in Jesus. It's telling us to get rid of sin. So yeast, or leaven, represents sin. So the children of Israel had to get rid of the sin. Well, didn't Jesus die to get rid of our sin? It's exactly what he died for. He himself was without sin. He was the lamb without blemish or spot. And he died to make us without blemish and without spot. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me explain something to you. You've got to know this. When you give your life to Jesus, it's not that he just wipes your slate clean. It's not just that, though that would be awesome. It's on the chalkboard he writes, Jesus Christ. When God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He just doesn't see somebody sinless. He sees somebody perfect. He sees Jesus Christ himself. You have Christ's righteousness in you based on what he's done on the cross. Holiday number one, Passover proper, the night of the Seder, represents the death of Jesus. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, what he died for to cleanse us from our sin. Then the third holiday is the festival known as First Fruits. Now, there's several festivals of First Fruits in the Bible. Each one is tied to a harvest, and during Passover, it was harvest time. This one is called First Fruits, and it comes in Leviticus chapter 23, where it talks about Passover, and here's what it says. 
Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you've come into the land which I give to you, and shall reap the harvest of it, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. So here's how it worked in those days. You owned a farm. You owned a ranch. You had sheep. You had crops. And a few times a year, you'd have a harvest. The very first stuff that, that was ripe and ready to go, you'd put in a basket, and you'd bring it to the temple in Jerusalem, and you'd give it to God. It was your way of saying, thank you, God, for taking care of us. And it was your way of saying, God, I trust you because this is all I got. I believe that you're going to make the rest happen. It was a matter of trust. First fruits means there's going to be latter fruits. There's going to be more to come. The first fruit holiday just means it's the start. More to follow. That's what first fruits is all about. Back to Corinthians. Listen to this. First fruits is the type. Listen to the antitype. First Corinthians 15:20. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All right, if Jesus is considered the first fruits, who's going to rise to dead after that? Let me see your hands. You guys! He's the first fruits, you're the crop to follow. He said, Because I live, you will live also. He got up from the dead. He promises that those who believe in him will also get up from the dead when it's time. It goes on. For since death came through a man. The resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. In Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive, each in his own turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes back, those who belong to him. Well, this is Easter. This is the holiday where we talk about him rising from the dead. And now I take it for granted. I believe he rose from the dead, and I am not a gullible person. I don't believe in the Easter Bunny. I don't believe in the Tooth Fairy. I believe Elvis died when everybody said he died. I don't believe in UFOs. Jury's still out on the Loch Ness Monster. When somebody calls me and says, I can make a million dollars if I just give them a thousand, they don't get my money. And I don't believe all those emails people send me. I'm not a gullible person, but I believe Jesus rose from the dead. There's a lot of good people who believe Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, I think there's tons of historical evidence. There's proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, when I say proof, maybe that's not the right word. I think I have to go with evidence. Because proof, how can you prove anything to anybody? You know? Proof is, is subjective. Evidence is objective. Um, I've told this before, but I love it, so I'll use it again. This guy goes to a doctor and says, Doctor, you've got to help me. I'm dead. So he said, come again? Doctor finally realized he's dealing with a man whose elevator didn't quite go to the top floor. And he's, he said, what do you mean you're dead? You look fine to me. No, 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 I'm dead. You've got to help me. You've got to help me. Doctor said, what do you mean you're dead? This doesn't make any sense to me. He said, are you educated? The guy goes, yeah, I've got a degree in biology. Well, then you know dead people don't bleed, right? Right. So he stabbed him with a needle, and the guy started to bleed. And the guy looked at him and goes, whoa. What do you know? Dead people do bleed. <laughs> Evidence and proof, right? You can't prove anything to anybody that they, they don't want to believe it. But evidence, it's for the jury, beyond a reasonable doubt. In fact, speaking of a jury, do you realize that every time a jury assembles and a courtroom hears a case, it's about the past? It's about history. It's about something they didn't see and they don't know anything about firsthand. So they gather evidence to find out if what's on trial actually happened or didn't happen. Is there evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that this guy shot that guy? Well, the guy shot. Yeah, but did this guy do it? For all we know, he shot himself. Do you have a witness? And there's all these rules and regulations that, that courtrooms use that say this is valid evidence and this is not valid evidence. And the farther back you go, the harder it gets. How many of you believe there was a president in the United States called Abraham Lincoln who presided over the freeing of the slaves through his policy? Let me see your hands. All right. How many of you knew him? How many of you were there? You believe something you have no firsthand knowledge of because the evidence is so overwhelming. Okay? That's all I'm getting at. Any historical event can be proven, not because you were there, but because the evidence is so overwhelming. Is there evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? 
Well, I'm going to share some of that with you in just a minute. But my favorite one is this. If he didn't, where's the body? <laughs> 